Just move it over. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, well, welcome to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. Um, we're going to be talking about supporting children and young people after abuse and neglect. And this has come out of the guidelines that we've developed as a group. I'm Corinne Majorhal, and I'm the chair of the guideline committee. We've been working with NICE and the uh, Social Care Collaborating Centre here at Sky to uh, develop the guidelines. I'm going to tell you all about the guidelines today, what's in them. And with me, I've got Jo Sharpen. Jo, do you want to just introduce Yes. Her? Hi, everyone. It's really good to see so many of you here. Um, I'm the policy manager at AVA Against Violence and Abuse, um, and we're a national charity. Um, and we facilitated the um, expert reference group made up of young people who were informing the guideline committee about their views and experiences. So we'll be speaking about uh, what they had to say um, soon. So we're going to run through some of the slides, but first of all, I wanted to know, have you looked at the guideline yet? <laughs> and it looks as if... Well, it's half and half. Half roughly. and half, yeah. Okay, good. So we'll see how it goes as, as we go through. <laughs> um, so first of all, let's look at the definition of abuse that uh, we used in the guideline. Sorry. We're just having a technical hitch here. So the definition was uh, derived from the definition that working together use, and it takes um, the same language. So a form of maltreatment of a child, somebody may abuse or neglect a child by inflicting harm or by failing to act to prevent harm. Children may be, be abused in a family or in an institutional or community setting by those known to them or more rarely by others, for example, via the internet and in other ways. They may be abused by an adult or adults or another child or children. And this includes the whole range of abuse and neglect, so emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, child sexual exploitation, uh, child trafficking, honour-based violence, FGM and witnessing uh, harm, including domestic abuse. So we, it, we had a very broad definition of abuse used in the guidance. And, uh, sorry, okay. So the process um, is quite interesting, I think, to people who are not familiar with NICE. Um, and many people in social care, social work, are not, uh, and, and working with children and young people, are not necessarily familiar with NICE guidance. And basically, it, it takes a particular process. So we had an overview of uh, review questions and those review questions follow uh, what's referred to as the pathway. So there's the recognition of abuse and neglect is the beginning of the pathway, then assessment of abuse and neglect, then prevention and early help, and then interventions following abuse and neglect. So we went through each of those four pathways to find evidence of effectiveness. So you can see the green line underneath those white lines um, show that we looked at effectiveness of tools to support recognition, effectiveness of tools to support assessment, and then the effectiveness of interventions. We also wanted to know <coughs> what supports and hinders those different bits of the pathway. And we wanted to collect the views and experiences of people who are involved in the system, whether that's uh, service users, practitioners, children and young people themselves. Um, so that's the broad outline. And then we, uh, uh, yeah, so then I wanted to show you that there is a website which you can 
click on to. The guideline is known as NG76, uh, but you can just type child abuse and neglect in the search uh, box on the NICE website and it immediately will take you to the guideline. It was published in full in October last year, so uh, you can follow it. And if you follow it, you'll, you'll get to this page which shows the different elements of the guideline. And the bit that I'm going to focus on today is the evidence, because the evidence is the bit that tells us how secure we can be in making recommendations in services and responses for children and young people. Okay, some people seem to be having trouble with the sound. Are we okay? All right. So the sources of evidence that we looked at uh, were wide. We looked at published research. Um, over 50,000 articles were screened on title and abstract. Uh, 989 were screened uh, for their full text, so they were read fully. And then 158 studies were finally included to support the recommendations that we make. There were some areas where we didn't have very much evidence at all, even though this was one of the guidelines in the sort of social care suite of guidelines that uh, had the most evidence. So um, there's been a lot of attention placed on the evidence uh, about the incidence of child abuse and neglect and its nature, extent, and so on, but, but, but less, much less, on the interventions and what helps and what we should do about it. So this is where we were focused, and we couldn't find very much that we could use that met the criteria, the standards, the quality standards of NICE on forced marriage, child sexual exploitation, female ge genital mutilation, and child trafficking. So we asked for expert testimony uh, from people who had been working in that field and had been um, doing research in the field to come and, and talk to us, particularly people from the University of Bedfordshire and so on. And then the other uh, part of our evidence was the expert reference group of 15 children and young people who met during the process. And Joe's going to talk a bit about that now. Yes, so um, it was a real honour for us to be able to facilitate this group. It was, um, I think, very important that young people and experts with lived experience were consulted for it to be a meaningful um, consultation process. So um, Ava put out a call nationally for um, organisations who support young people who've experienced abuse and or neglect. Um, and we had a lot of people who wanted to take part. Uh, we ended up having two groups, one in London, uh, mainly made up from young people from Limes College Pupil Referral Unit in Sutton, and then also a group of young women in Sheffield who were part of the Young Women's Housing Project there. Um, and it was an amazing experience to be able to facilitate these groups. Um, we had about 15 young people, uh, mostly young women, but we did have some young men in the London group. Um, each time we met, we looked at a different theme. So um, we'll be looking mainly at the early help um, theme today, but we also looked at recognition and assessment. So when you were experiencing abuse and neglect, how, um, how did people pick up on it? How were you able to disclose this? Um, and what was the response from services once that abuse had been identified. Uh, we had lots of different examples, positive and negative, as you can imagine. Um, and then when the draft recommendations had been drawn up by the guideline committee, we took them back to the young people and they were able to comment and, um, and see how their views had been included. We brought the young people to London to meet some of the guideline committee um, because I think initially they weren't really sure about what these guidelines meant um, and, and how they would actually have an impact in practice and in real life. Um, and it was amazing to, um, to see how their views changed over the course of this um, consultation where they became incredibly um, 
proud of their work and really empowered actually in terms of um, when they saw the impact that their views had made. So almost without exception, um, their recommendations were included by the committee. Um, it was really empowering for them as victims of abuse and neglect um, to have their voices heard where unfortunately we know that many, many uh, survivors of abuse and especially children um, are often silenced and not given opportunities to, to speak. And when they realise that actually their views would have a massive impact on policy and practice in the future, um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience for them. Um, and we'll be telling you a little bit more later on, but one thing that came out of this project was the young people decided they really wanted to have um, a version of the guidelines for other young people um, to be able to, to almost see what they're entitled to when they are going through um, the social care process. Um, so we've worked with them to design and write a, a quick guide around this guideline, which will be launched tomorrow. Um, we've also done a short film with them and other things that you may see about tomorrow when we launch the guidelines. So we'll show you that at the very end of the presentation. But do look out for that. And please, if you are working with young people, please make them aware of this quick guide. Um, there are copies that you can download. You can print it off. Um, the young people themselves have written it and it is really crucial that they know what their, their rights are, what they're entitled to and how to get help if they need it. So please do share that very widely. So in terms of some of the main principles, um, the direct work with young people is really important and I know those of you that do this work know how important it is to build this kind of trusting relationship um, and I won't read through the whole slide you can see there but there are some um, of these recommendations these all came directly from the young people some of them um, were particularly um, important to them so you might expect that the confidentiality um, point was really important for those young people. They really need to know who you're going to share information with, why um, and what will happen next. Um, active listening skills, empathy, being sensitive and so on, um, you know, should be a normal way of working with young people. But some of the examples I heard of, unfortunately, weren't using those particular skills. Um, we need to make sure we're always checking the understanding of what children have told us. And that links also into um, the one further down the page about producing a record and checking content with children. So a lot of children felt that um, they were explaining what had happened to them and then the report that they saw at the end of that had no reflection on actually what had um, what had they'd said and what they'd experienced. Um, so it's really important that we're understanding what the children have told us um, and there's a specific recommendation in the guidelines about making a record of what's been said in the child's own words um, that they they check and they sign in order to say that they agree with what has been said and how it's been recorded um, which is a fantastic recommendation and something the young people were really proud of um, of getting in there we need to make sure as well that we're talking to children in their own language um, that we maybe think about creative ways of talking to children whether it's using books pictures artwork um, we need to think about what developmental stage they're at, what communication needs they've got. Um, and also thinking about um, contact as well. So a lot of young people had examples where um, practitioners had kind of turned up at the school unannounced to see them or had rung them on a phone that the um, potential perpetrator um, had access to and was able to see in messages and listen to voicemails, which put them at risk. Um, so whilst you also need to be giving them support around who to contact out of hours and so on, um, you, it needs to be mutual. They need to know um, how they can contact you and you need to check how you can contact them um, in a safe way. Um, so really the root of all of these principles is about having respect for those young people, um, thinking about where they are um, in their lives, in their journey of healing and recovery. Um, and how to work with them in a sensitive and empathic way. And one more I will just um, talk about is the uh, seeking permission when touching. So if you are doing, for instance, a medical examination, it seems common sense to ask before you touch somebody to explain what you're going to do. Um, but again and again, the children had experiences where they were uh, that wasn't happening for them. And that can re-traumatise children who have been abused. So um, uh, it sounds maybe uh, quite simple, like common sense, but actually it's, it's something that um, is incredibly important when you're working with a young person who is, um, who's experienced abuse and trauma. Okay, so um, that then follows into the principles for work with parents and carers. On our group, we had 
some experts by experience, including um, parents uh, uh, who were either adopted parents or foster carers or parents themselves of children who've been through the process. Um, and some of this evidence comes from them, and some of this evidence comes from the views and experiences literature. But um, it was really clear that, that a number of the principles that Joe's just talked about in terms of working with children and young people also apply to parents. So active listening, being open and honest, and seeking to empower them and engage them in finding solutions is fairly... Um, basic and standard and fundamental to relationship-based practice. Um, avoiding blame is one, even if they may be responsible for the child abuse or neglect, but is important to remember. So inviting and discussing worries and so on. You can read these yourselves and the slides will be available to you. Um, and I'm just here picking out some of the most important ones. But again, as with the children and young people, agreeing records of conversations and sharing relevant documents and plans is very important to parents. And being clear also, though, about the legal context in which any involvement that uh, practitioners might have is taking place. So, we did look at recognition as the early part of the, the pathway. And there has been a previous guideline published by NICE, uh, CG89, which is really designed for um, people working in health settings, in clinics and in hospitals. Um, and this then was adopted by our guideline and we added to it so that we wanted to extend the kinds of issues that might, uh, signs and symptoms and, and alerting issues that might um, appear anywhere. So in schools, in, um, uh, in homes, wherever children are basically and not just in their clinical presentation. So um, one of the principles that we wanted to uh, attend to was that, and the previous guideline didn't do this, was that we should take account of other causes as the previous guideline recommends, but that we wanted to add that this shouldn't mean that alerting features would be dismissed. So we now know that, uh, for example, disabled children are more vulnerable to uh, abuse and neglect. And quite often we also know that in the past this gets missed because their disability might um, disguise those alerting features. Similarly, children going through dis distressful events uh, where their parents may be separating or maybe there's been a bereavement it doesn't mean necessarily that the, that the alerting features are due to those causes and we should always keep an open mind that those alerting features might be uh, the consequence of abuse and neglect. So we wanted to make that point clear. And the other point we wanted to emphasize was that, um, that alerting features might not be due to abuse occurring right now in the present but could be due to non-recent child abuse or neglect in the past. So behaviours that could explain why a child um, was behaving in the way they did might have um, been dismissed because abuse and neglect might not be happening now, but could well be linked to the past. And finding the right responses for those children is just as important, even though they um, may not be, as I say, experiencing it now. I think that, well, it links into it. I've just seen a comment from someone saying that um, there are some basic principles of trauma-informed care. We should all make sure we're aware of these. And I really agree. And I think the, the best way to summarise that is instead of thinking what's wrong with this child, we say um, what has this child experienced or been through. Um, and then that shows us maybe their behaviour is manifesting in a certain way because of the trauma they've experienced. And like Corinne said, that could be recently or it could 
have been years ago. Um, but we need to realise that trauma impacts on children's behaviour um, in many different ways, and sometimes it's easy to misdiagnose that as, as other things, such as ADHD, for instance, as one example. Um, so yes, basic trauma-informed principles are so important. So uh, we need to be thinking about what's happened to a child rather than assuming there's something wrong with them for them to be acting in a certain way. So um, we did get quite a lot of. Oh, just go no, back. back. We did get <laughs> when the uh, consultation. So what Nice does is it puts the guideline out for consultation to stakeholders. Now these are people. There are organisations who have signed up as stakeholders to the guideline, um, and there are a very wide, wide range of organisations, including local authorities. Um, different health organizations, dentists, the association, the College of Dentists and so on. So so we put this out and the press picked up uh, the some of the signs that we'd identified, uh, including one that was sort of saying that when children have tantrums they should um, we should consider child abuse and neglect. Now that isn't what we were saying mm -hmm. at all. Um, but it made a good press story. What we were saying is that a marked change in behaviour or emotional state could be an indicator and that it's something that should be uh, inquired about further, that we should care for children and their emotional state and find out what might be troubling them. Um, there, were some, uh, there were some signs that the guideline group felt were quite important uh, one of those was dissociation, so transient episodes of detachment outside of the child's control. Um, responses that to examinations or assessments that were unexpected. Um, sexual behaviour, which is indiscriminate, uh, precocious or coercive. And then things like scavenging, stealing, hoarding or hiding food with no medical explanation. Um, so these are, there, there is a range of different signs and, and in some ways every child is different and their expression of um, distress will be different and it really is about how do we actively listen to what the child is trying to tell us. So one of the surprising things, I think, for the guideline group, and possibly it might surprise you too, is that we couldn't find evidence of a sufficient standard to say, look, here is a list of all the signs that indicate child abuse, or here is a list that indicates and allows us to assess risk. Um, what we could find were a lot of attempts to do that, but they didn't really meet the standards of the guideline. So, in the end, we derived some broad principles from studies that we could rely on. So, these broad principles for assessment are the ones that we've included in our recommendations. So, we should obviously observe the child or young person including their relationships with parents or carers. Now this is something that is said in government guidance anyway and a number of the recommendations that we make might look as if they are repeating guidance, statutory guidance such as in working together or the framework for assessment but actually we have only endorsed those um, recommendations where we have additional evidence for them so we're not just repeating uh, what the statutory guidance tells us. So communication directly with the child or young person without their parent or carer being present but with the parent or carer's consent is something that we was shown to be important. Um, addressing both the strengths and weaknesses of parents, carers and the wider family network was also something that was important in assessment. Acknowledging that parenting can change over time and meaning that these things aren't fixed. People can change um, and should be, the, the situation should be reviewed on a regular basis. 
focusing attention equally on male and female parents and carers was a really important <coughs> recommendation and that came out of the analyses of uh, serious case reviews. Um, and finally, analysis was something, uh, so it's about not just observing signs and symptoms or observing behaviours or and, and uh, uh, identifying strengths and weaknesses and so on, but actually doing an analysis of those factors to evaluate the impact of them uh, on the child or young person and considering what they may mean for future action, putting it all together and coming out with recommendations for action. Um, and if I can just add some of the um, points that the children and young people made, um, they were they wanted to talk about assessments quite a lot, and on the whole, they completely understand the need for them and um, and why they're why they're required, and they want to take part. But they did um, say that they want those assessments to be linked to a package of support. They don't just want to be asked a load of questions and for it to not lead anywhere. They were very keen that it should be a supportive conversation and not just some kind of tick box exercise. Um, and some of them said that they get asked the same questions, the same assessments again and again by different professionals. Um, and sometimes they end up lying because they're just so fed up with it or because they don't have that trusting relationship with the person asking them. So they do understand the point of assessments. They want it, but they want it to be linked to some actual concrete support. Um, and, and they want it to be a supportive conversation. Okay, so, so one or two of you are asking whether the evidence standards are available online, and the answer is yes. Um, that first uh, slide that I showed, which had the NICE, it was the screenshot of the NICE website, um, has the evidence tab circled, and if you click on there, you'll find a whole host of evidence behind it. So please do go there and, and have a look. Okay, so moving on, um, we also looked at interventions um, and we looked at the evidence in relation to each of our agreed outcome areas. Now these were very rigorous, so we wanted to know if there is an intervention, does it stop abuse or neglect? Does it impact on the incidence of abuse and neglect? And actually very few studies measure that. Um, does it stop the risk of abuse and neglect? Well, a lot more studies measured that. But of course, the risk of abuse and neglect can be quite a problematic concept um, because it might be the things um, that put children, that appear to put children at risk that are being measured rather than the actual risk of abuse and neglect, if that makes sense. So um, that we had to do some very careful screening of that literature. We also wanted to know if interventions improve the quality of parenting and parent-child relationships, whether they improve children and young people's health and well-being, whether they improve the caregiver's health and well-being, and then some soft outcome measures of satisfaction with services and the service outcomes. Uh, so that was the hierarchy, as it were, of our outcome areas. We wanted to really find the, the interventions that stopped abuse and neglect. And I'm going to just run through an example of some of those. So coming back to our pathway, I'm going to look at the prevention early help strand. Now one of the things that I just want to clarify is that we um, didn't look at universal services. Many people think that when we talk about prevention, we're talking about the universal services that are geared towards preventing uh, all harms to children, including abuse and neglect. We did do that. We, look, we, we wanted to look at in interventions that were targeted at preventing abuse and neglect themselves. Um, and we also wanted to adopt the early help um, under, the understanding of early help that was really uh, arising out of the Munro review, which is that we should be seeking, it's not about early intervention as in one to five year olds or naught to five year olds, but it's about providing help when 
the alerting features of abuse and neglect first appear and that can be at any age. So we wanted to know what works in that early help setting. Okay. So one of the things that we found was that some parenting programs do provide some help to some families and children. And so what we do is we say consider offering a parenting program. Now that ex that statement needs explaining because under, NICE has a sort of language which we had to use and consider means that there's some evidence to support it but it's not strong enough to say we must offer and there were very few things that we could say we must do because the evidence wasn't strong enough for that. So consider means there's some support, some research that supports offering parenting programs for children and families. The other element of this, which we've already touched on in the principles, is that children and families should be given a choice of parenting programs. There are different types of parenting programs and it may be that some are more relevant than others to them. Uh, I've, asked, uh, I've suggested that we ask, would the parent benefit from three different elements? And these three different elements um, are uh, represented in different parenting programs, sometimes all three and sometimes only one. So we need to tailor the parenting program to the needs of the child and the family. So would, would, the, would they benefit from developing skills in positive behaviour management? There are programmes for that. Would they benefit from addressing negative beliefs about parenting? Or would they benefit from managing difficult emotions, for example, anger management? But one thing that we found out of the views and experiences research was that early help should include both practical and emotional support as well as the sort of targeted programs. So parents <coughs> and carers really value uh, practical help, not surprisingly, even if that's not necessarily directly connected to the abuse and neglect, it enables relationships to form and helps, it is helping to meet a need. Um, yeah, just one thing that I would add around parenting programs is just to be mindful that um, sometimes there are not a lot of services out there and it, and it might be that parenting programs are one of the things that are readily available, um, but sometimes that can, um, can kind of stigmatise um, parents in a way. So we often see a lot of women who've experienced domestic violence being sent on a parenting program as if it was an issue with their parenting and not an issue with... Um, with the perpetrator's behaviour and actually the children's behaviour is a manifestation of their trauma um, and sometimes parenting programmes might not be the best situation for that. Um, maybe they might be helpful but it needs to, again, to, you need to look at the family as a holistic whole uh, to work out what's going to be best for that that child and that, um, and that parent as well as the um, potential perpetrator within the, um, the setting. So I guess it's just about being mindful of that and the young people were very keen that that was um, that, that was mentioned. Um, and some of the young people we worked with were teenage parents as well themselves and um, felt sometimes that um, people were assuming um, that they wouldn't be able to parent um, very well because of their experiences of abuse and neglect themselves as children. Um, and they were very adamant that actually know that they, they felt that they were very good parents and they wanted that acknowledged as well. Really important point being made by Grace Gillen there, I think, um, that often find that during training professionals find it easy to identify what they're worried about with case studies, but often find it difficult to identify strengths. And that was something that is endorsed by our recommendations, that strengths should be focused on as well as uh, the difficulties. Um, Okay, and I really like Rachel Wood's comment. Uh, I would love to see more co-production of innovative parenting programs. Yes, Wouldn't let's that do it. Be good? <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? That would be. We need it, and we do need to develop science-based 
and evidence-based um, services. So if we do have some co-produce innovative parenting programs, let's make sure that they can be uh, included in the sort of repertoire of recommendations that would come out of a process like this. Mm. And Vivian's mentioned about how intervention can actually be at a time of escalated violence and risk and can actually increase risk sometimes if not done sure. appropriately. So that's a brilliant point there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, so early help, the, the second element, example of early help I'm going to give is about home visiting. And I, I've put this in because there has been quite a lot of attention paid to home visiting over the last few years. There are a number of home visiting programs that do have a substantial amount of evidence behind them. Not all of that is conclusive in terms of the outcomes. But we did find that there was support for considering offering a home visiting programme, but it had to last for at least six months, and it had to be in addition to any universal home visiting services. The kinds of things it should include are support to develop positive relationships, things like understanding the behaviour of the child, modelling, observation and feedback. Uh, developing problem-solving skills, addressing the impact of substance use, domestic abuse and mental distress, so really focusing on what is commonly known as the toxic trio, um, and support to access other services. So that needs to go on top of any kind of routine home visiting that's going on, and it needs to last for at least six months to have uh, an impact on preventing child abuse and neglect in the future. Okay, so we also looked at what helps or hinders this early help area. And of course the hinders are the things, are the converse of each of these. These are the, these are the elements that, that help in these early help interventions. So an understanding of typical and atypical child development in a holistic sense, tailoring interventions to the needs of the child and carers, including any disability or learning disability, understanding parental vulnerability factors for child abuse and neglect, awareness of the possibility of escalation of risk. And I want to focus on that because that was quite an important finding that came out again of a overall analysis of serious case reviews. And it would appear that people might be good at identifying risk, but are not necessarily clear about when risk is escalating and where family circumstances change. This is very important. Understanding how to work with families as a whole in order to better support children and young people and offering practical uh, and emotional help, as I mentioned earlier. I just want to mention Louise there, who's mentioned um, her programme, Parents as First Teachers, which sounds brilliant. And um, I have to give them a highlight, a shout out, because um, Louise runs the... Um, the group of young people in Sheffield who are part of our expert advisory group. So um, it's really good that they're here. Okay. Um, so one or two of you are raising the issue of uh, resources. So Latoya's just noted that she used to run uh, Strengthening Families, Strengthening Communities, but it appears there's no funding for it now. This was a problem for the group, uh, the guideline group, when we were deliberating on our recommendations. And in the first consultation on the guidelines that we put out to stakeholders, a number of the responses were saying, well, yeah, uh, we can't afford to do this. We can't afford to implement these recommendations. Well, we kind of knew that when we were making them, and we all understood the context of austerity. That, that we're working in. And it's not that we don't think that's a problem. Yes, we do. But what we wanted to do was to say, 
at least if you do have a budget for something, then please look at how you're spending it. Yes, we want to support the development of these programs. We want to support the development of, of effective interventions. Um, and we should be using the evidence to press for services. And I know it's a difficult time out there and it's a difficult context, but we can't stop pressing for them. So I, you know, I understand the resource issue, but I think we still need to say, well, but this is what we need. So here are some examples of early help parenting programs. Um, so educational interventions delivered over a relatively, relatively short period. Sessions were generally thematic or delivered on a modular basis and were typically focused on enhancing parenting skills, addressing negative parenting behaviours and developing coping strategies and child behaviour management techniques. There were structured delivery of the sessions and the use of workbooks to provide further information. So, so there, are, there, there are a number of examples in the guidelines and in the evidence of these programmes which you're uh, welcome to go and have a look at. I put this slide up because I wanted to show how then these um, programs measured up against our outcome measures. And you can see, now the green means that there's, there was some evidence to support them. Um, the yellow means that it was that there were some studies that supported the, the intervention and some studies that didn't, so it's equivocal. There were some for and some against. And the white boxes tell you where it wasn't measured at all. And so for the parenting programs overall, the effectiveness of those didn't measure the incidence of abuse and neglect. So we don't know if those programs actually stop abuse and neglect. We do know that they may reduce the risk of abuse and neglect, and they might improve the quality of parenting and parent-child relationships. Most often, of course, that's the mother-child relationship and not the father-child relationship. Um, some help with children and young people's health and well-being, some don't, and the same for caregivers. Satisfaction with services, uh, there wasn't sufficient evidence for that to be measured. So that point about, you know, we need more focus on the soft outcomes, but we also need more focus on the hard outcomes too. Um, okay. no. So, uh, parent-child interaction therapy was another um, suite of studies around that. And that's an intervention that aims to improve the quality of parent-child relationships. Um, and sessions usually include a combination of instruction, coaching, and role play. And we found evidence from two moderate quality randomized controlled trials, one from the US and one from Australia. <laughs> So that's the outcome from that suite of studies. So incidence of abuse and neglect, again, was not measured. Risk was measured, and this parent-child interaction therapy had no impact on the risk of abuse and neglect. But there was a small amount of um, influence on the quality of relationships and on health and well-being for both children and their caregivers. Again, the soft measure, satisfaction with services, wasn't measured. OK. Now, it's a sort of uh, a media myth and general, um, general myth in some ways that when children have been abused and neglected, um, they are removed from their families, and we all know that that isn't necessarily the case. It is incredibly important that we do keep working with children after abuse and neglect have been identified, and we do keep working a 
appropriately with their carers, whether that's the parents who, it, who may still be living with the child at home, or whether it's foster carers, kinship carers, or whether it's adopted parents. And there is a different kind of, there are different interventions that we identified uh, for those different groups of people. Some of them overlap, so there's certainly commonality around attachment-based interventions. These uh, did get a strong evidential support. And you'll notice from this chart, which you can find in the recommendations and in the guidelines, you'll notice from this chart that there are sort of age specifications. So we go up to age five for attachment-based uh, interventions and child parent psychotherapy for parents or carers. We go up to age uh, 13 for comprehensive parenting interventions and parent-child interaction therapy. And then we go up from the age of 10 to 18 for multi-systemic therapy. Now that's because not because we we don't think that those things would work for children either younger or older, but because the evidence only covers those age ranges. So what we ask is that in future um, studies look at the application of some of those interventions to other age ranges within childhood. Um, and these are the, the same, it's the same uh, principle for interventions for child sexual abuse. So trauma-focused cognitive behavioural therapy has been found to have support from the research. Um, and therapeutic programmes such as Letting the Future In have, have support, they've been well evaluated. And then group or individual psychoanalytic therapy and we put in brackets girls only, but this is because that's what the that's what the research was based on only on girls. It could well be effective for boys, but we just don't <coughs> know. Um, one of the issues was that with the um, children and young people's group was that they were quite clear that they weren't happy about cognitive behavioural mm. therapy, and we had a number of discussions about whether we should include it. Um, jo, I don't know if you want to say mm. something about that. It was very clear that young people who, who had been offered some kind of um, therapeutic intervention, it generally was cognitive behavioural therapy, and they found it to not be helpful. And I think that's probably because it just deals with what's presenting on the surface and not looking below at the trauma that's caused um, that particular behaviour. So I think the important thing here is the fact that it says trauma-focused CBT rather than just the kind of standard CBT. Um, and I think that's a really important important distinction to make because a lot of young people were saying if you offer a CBT you won't see us again. Um, they were very clear that it just didn't help and actually sometimes made things worse. Okay so this is um, this next slide shows the is a, is a kind of indication I just wanted to share that the, the NICE website has a number of sort of facets to it and one of them is it's got a, it's got a page the tabs at the top are our tools and resources and this one is a baseline assessment tool it's just a snapshot of a very small part of it but it gives a sheet a data sheet summarizing each recommendation so you can see them very quickly it's on a spreadsheet and it gives a clear description of who should take action for each recommendation so not all of these recommendations will apply to all people working with children. Um, and it's a helpful tool, especially if you're working in an organisation and you want to do a check of, well, an audit, sort of how far have we got with, um, with applying these guidelines and, and actually are we working to ensure that children and young people get the help they need following abuse and neglect as well as before um, when when the abuse and neglect is being identified. So we, we do generally have a lot of a focus on identification but working with children afterwards and with their carers is a major area. So these, this tool helps us to look at that 
uh, in more detail. And finally, in the tools and resources, there's an interactive flowchart for every stage of the pathway. So you can just click on any one of those boxes. This isn't an interactive slide, but you, if you just go onto the website, you can get into the pathways and you can click on any one of these and it opens up a whole range of information for each um, box. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh. So this is a cover of the quick guide um, that the young people developed. So our group in, in London and Sheffield um, wrote this. And this was their idea. Um, and they um, worked with the designers to come up with a design they liked. So in this guide, you'll find um, some information clearly explaining what child abuse and neglect is, um, how you may feel if these things are happening to you, um, what the guideline says you are entitled to. So a lot of the core principles that we looked at at the beginning of the webinar um, are in there in terms of what they are, uh, what they should be receiving uh, from a service. Um, there's some really useful information about what they should do, um, who they can contact, what they should do if they feel they're not getting that kind of service, but also um, what services are out there who can support them around child abuse and neglect. Um, and there's a case study as well um, showing where, um, where this has worked really positively. Positively. So this will be out tomorrow. It will be on the um, the Nice and the Sky websites, and also on the Ava website. Uh, and we're going to try and share it as widely as possible on um, social media, so that young people see it. Um, so if you work with young people, please do um, make them aware of this and, and get them to start sharing it on social media as well. Okay. So there's an a interesting comment here by Karen Roost. Um, which notes that she agrees with more longitudinal studies to support the evidence base for interventions. We've made some research recommendations as a consequence of the findings of our guideline group, which um, actually do say that we need more longitudinal studies, um, particularly around early help and home visiting. And we need to know what the components are of successful programs because all too often um, they're not clearly specified um, and we need to know which bits of for example a home visiting program work and, and which bits don't um, so much more specific uh, evidence as well okay so it's really good to see positive feedback about the the quick guide I'm glad that you think it it will be useful. Does anyone have any other questions for the last few minutes of the webinar? Really good. Will there be paper versions of this? Done. Yeah, yeah, I think it's probably a case of downloading it. It's been designed as a PDF specifically so that when you print it, you can kind of fold it into an A5 booklet. That seemed to be what the young people preferred in terms of size. So when you look at it online, it might look like the pages are slightly out of sync because it's designed to be printed and, and folded in that way. Paper would be useful. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Magdalene, Magdalene uh, Kimani asked, did we work with families affected by FGM? Well, no. Um, we, we didn't work with any families in the guideline. Um, we had, as, as Joe's explained, 15 children and young people supporting the guideline, and we did have um, different, uh, four different members uh, with different experiences themselves of child abuse and neglect. Uh, but we, what we did do was we uh, called in expert witnesses around FGM, so people who had worked with families affected by FGM, and we do make some recommendations in the guidelines around that issue. Pete is asking if there'll be an e-bulletin that he can forward out. It'll be in the Sky e-bulletin. The Sky e-bulletin, yes. And it will be in the AVA newsletter as well. Okay, now um, there was a comment 
Oh yes, Jeff Core, you have not mentioned cumulative neglect. So that's that's an interesting point. Um, it, what it does point to is um, the, all the different aspects of child abuse and neglect. Uh, so child abuse and neglect has many different forms. Cumulative neglect is, is one of those forms. And hopefully um, the guidelines will be relevant to those different forms of abuse and neglect but we could only go with where the evidence took us and um, there are some there were there was some research around neglect and we've reported on that but cumulative neglect may not have been specifically identified in those studies so again we were limited by what the studies would allow us to say um, Julie has asked if the Quick Guide is UK based, and it is because it's linked to these particular guidelines, and it mentions services within the UK. But the principles generally around what children should expect, I think, are universal, really. Um, so it could be used as a starting point for um, for having those discussions and, and developing this sort of work um, in other countries. Absolutely, it would be great. So the, the evidence has come from all over the world. We looked at evidence from as many countries as possibly. It had to be written in English, but otherwise we, we took what we could find um, because we really wanted to make sure that we had all the best uh, evidence out there. So it will be relevant and there will be things that would need to change in terms of application but that's an interesting project to work on. Mm. Okay, so shall, could we just do another poll? So how many people feel the guidelines will be useful? Do you think the guidelines will be useful? So I'm going to be asking now whether you think after this presentation the guidelines will be useful to you uh, in your work or practice or in any other way. To you. <laughs> That's the right answer. Right. right. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. And I'll make sure that the positive feedback about the quick guide gets um, fed back to the young people as well. I know Louise is in the chat room now, but um, for the London group as well, I think it will mean a lot to them to hear um, your views. But please, finally, please go on the website at, at NICE and dig down into that evidence because it's one of the greatest resources that we have um, looking at how to critically appraise all the, all the research that's being done around uh, interventions in child abuse and neglect. It's a fantastic amount of work that's been put in by Sky and the team and various um, partners to the project from uh, different universities, University of London and so on. So really worth a look at digging down and ferreting around. Don't just take the guidelines on face value, go behind them too. Yeah. So bye for now and thanks very much for joining. And yeah. we'll keep we'll we'll run through the questions that you've asked and we haven't managed to address because there's quite a few uh, and we'll try and get around to answering them as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much.